السلام علیکم اعزاز صاحب Welcome, Dr. Sanadi. Thank you very much. Is that sir, with your permission, sir? Yes, sir. We'll start with the Quran. The Quran is the Quran. The Quran is the Quran. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم شروع الله کا نام لے کر جو بڑا مہربان نہایت رحم والا ہے انا اعطيناك الكوثر اے نبی صلی اللہ علیہ وآلہ وسلم ہم نے تم کو کوثر یعنی بہت زیادہ بھلائی عطا فرمائی ہے فصل لربك وانحر تو اپنے پروردگار کے لیے نماز پڑھا کرو اور قربانی کیا کرو ان هو کچھ شک نہیں کہ تمہارا دشمن ہی بے نام رہے گا بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ڈسٹنگوش اسپیکر ڈاکٹر محمد علی اسماعیل پرنسپل انویسٹیگیٹر نیشنل سینٹر آف بگ ڈیٹا اینڈ کلاؤڈ کمپیوٹنگ کراچی ڈاکٹر حسین ندیم ایگزیکٹو ڈائریکٹر اسلام آباد پالیسی ریسرچ انسٹیٹیوٹ Ms. Amna Rafiq, Research Associate, ACDC, ISSI, dear participants, Assalamu alaikum. My name is Malik Hasim Mustafa and I'm Director at the Arms Control and Disarmament Center and also the two days uh, events moderator. On behalf of the Institute of Strategic Studies, Islamabad and Arms Control and Disarmament Center, I welcome you all on this webinar on Big Data for National Security, a case of Pakistan. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, If we simply explain big data, it means a large amount of complex data set, which is received as fast, at fast velocity rate and contains greater variety. According to experts, it can influence every aspect of individual human life and society and global communication, including delivery services and infrastructure and related areas. However, it is also creating new novel inescapable and unpredictable international, national, and individual security challenges. 
Therefore, its misuse can equally exacerbate existing national security threats and can create new unpredictable ones. Pakistan equally recognized the potential and reaches of big data for socioeconomic development and national security challenges. Big data is an unexplored and uncharted territory in Pakistan. There is a need to identify the potential spectrum for designing the normative and legal frameworks at a national level for big data. And for that purpose, uh, the Arms Control and Disarmament Center organized this webinar on big data for national security with following objectives. Number one, uh, we want to identify the socioeconomic opportunities and security challenges posed by big data in Pakistan. Number two, to analyze various ways to enhance responsible behavior and mechanisms vis-a-vis -vis big data management in Pakistan. And number three, to look forward for a way forward for Pakistan for building a national framework for big data. Uh, before we uh, now we formally uh, begin our uh, webinar, first of all, I would like to invite Ambassador Zaz Ahmed Chaudhary, Director General of SAIF, for his welcome remarks. Ambassador Chaudhary has served as a member of Foreign Service of Pakistan for 37 years, rising to the rank of Foreign Secretary of Pakistan for over three years. Mr. Chaudhary's last diplomatic assignment was an ambassador of Pakistan to the United States of America. He has authored two books and numerous research articles. His recent book, a memoir diplomatic footprint discusses the intricacies of foreign policy making in Pakistan. After his retirement from the Foreign Service, Ambassador Chaudhary has been serving as Director General of the Institute of Strategic Studies, Islamabad. Sir, you have the floor now. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kasim. Uh, let me commend you and uh, your team uh, in the Arms Control uh, and Disarmament Center for putting together this webinar on a subject which uh, is uh, for most of us uh, rather new. Um, our center, ACDC, uh, under your leadership is focusing on emerging technologies and their impact on our national security. So today's webinar, I believe, is a series, is part of a series of programs on emerging technologies. Now, um, Today, I, uh, when I looked at the subject, I must say uh, with great honesty that my knowledge of this subject is rather limited to what I have discovered on various search engines in the maze of uh, web. Um, <clears throat> but what I have discovered is that the big data refers to a term that describes a collection of data which is huge in size, comes at you at enormous velocities or speed and continues to grow. Uh, and so you need big data technologies to uh, handle and store that data, to analyze that data, to manage this uh, data and then come up with smart solutions uh, from this chaos uh, or this explosion of uh, information. If that be the case, uh, that means that this, is, this data explosion or big data is going to touch nearly every aspect of our, uh, our life, whether it is agriculture or medicine or stock exchanges or social media or, um, um, or even human security as, as one of uh, your experts will speak about today. Uh, so the governments, the private individuals, private organizations, uh, non-state, everybody, I think, will be probably keen to know how to make better use of big data and big data technologies and analytics. Um, I must also add here that uh, this morning I was uh, reading about the technological race between the United States and China. I understand it to be full on uh, and uh, is, big data is going to play a big part in, in that uh, race. Um, my sense is that when I look at those statistics, they sometimes are kind of mind boggling. Um, for example, uh, I read that China now is the top manufacturer globally of 250 million computers, 25 million automobiles, and 
billion smartphones. Similarly, somebody, uh, we saw the CIPRI report that United States military spending is $801 billion, whereas China's is only $293 billion, but United States is now, despite a reduction of 1.4% in their military spending, is spending on uh, technological edge and innovation in military technologies. Uh, China continues to focus on, uh, on consumer goods. I think it's producing 50% world's computers and mobile phones, whereas US is producing only 6%. We also see uh, uh, a very interesting figure uh, that China has nine times as many 5G base stations with network speeds five times as fast as American equivalents. So there's a huge race, technological race, between not only China and the US, but I'll also, I believe, other uh, countries uh, around the world, especially in Europe. Uh, in that case, I think it is important for the people of Pakistan to be more aware on what big data can do to help us, but also uh, uh, to undermine some of our uh, national security aspects. So I'm keenly looking forward to several experts who have gathered. I know uh, at least some of them. So I am as keen, I hope that uh, you, as you all are to listening to them. So thank you so much to all the speakers for making your time. And back to you, Kasim. Uh, thank you, Professor Zahidam. Uh, sir, you have rightly pointed out that uh, big data is really a complex phenomena and uh, it's around us, but we really lack the understanding of uh, this uh, concept, this technology. But we are uh, fortunate and we are honored that we have the uh, best expert among us to explain this phenomena to us. And for that purpose, uh, I would like to first invite our first speaker, uh, Dr. Muhammad Ali Ismail. Dr. Muhammad Ali Ismail is member uh, IEE and MIET and is a professor and chair at the Department of Computer and Information System Engineering, NED University of Engineering and Technology. He's also serving as a director, High Performance Computing Center, Scientific Director, uh, Excellus Open Data Analytics Lab, National Center in Big Data and Cloud Computing at the same university. He has more than 80 years of 18 years of research experience in teaching and administration in both national and international universities. He did his PhD in high performance uh, computing in 2011. He has published over 75, 75 scientific papers in international journals and conferences, along with the US patent. He has uh, won many national and international grants worth over uh, 200 million. Sir, I hand over the floor to you now. Uh -huh. Thank you, uh, Tarek sir, uh, Malik sir. Uh, besides uh, respected guests, especially the ambassador, as is Chaudhary Ahmed sir, and ambassador Khamil Nehru sir, and other distinguished guests and speakers, Assalamualaikum. First of all, I would like to extend my uh, thanks and gratitude uh, for appoint, just uh, inviting me and giving me the great opportunity uh, to just share uh, something, some ideas or some. Uh, ongoing works uh, in this uh, era of big data. Uh, here I have some slides uh, that I would like to share. Uh, is it visible? Yes, sir. So, kindly, thoda sa kar apuncha bol thoda sa bolam. Okay. Uh, now it's visible. It's fine now. Yes, please, sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, actually, uh, this is a big data. Obviously, as uh, the earlier speakers has point it out, uh, this is a big data. Obviously, it is a, going to be a very big challenge. Still, it's a big challenge, as its name is the big data. Uh, the term was first coined in 2000, around 12 and 14. And uh, this come become the hot topic in the 2017 and 18, people started to do research on it. And uh, interestingly, and very luckily, uh, at that time, the Pakistan government also, uh, and HEC also, uh, think of thought about that okay, we have to deal with this uh, uh, upcoming technologies then uh, that the uh, concept of a uh, national centers in a big data and cloud computing at that time was emerged and was discussed and uh, after a very uh, competitive uh, process uh, in the, we were able at any uh, to establish a national center in big data and cloud computing 
So, uh, first, and obviously, uh, in their absence here, I would like again, uh, as many as time, I thanks to HSE and uh, Planning and Commission in 2018 at that time that uh, they thought about it and they give an opportunity uh, to the NAD University to establish one of the center here. And afterwards, in 2018, we started to do research in the different areas. And the idea was all about that we have to tackle all these national level problems. Uh, because as we have said that the big data is all about the huge data coming with a huge velocity and having the very huge different types of the varieties. Actually, it started with the three Vs first, the velocity, variety, and volume. And then now we have nine to 12 and even 15 Vs associated with this big data. Then we started uh, working on that. Uh, this is the actual uh, space, actual uh, building that we have uh, it, at NAD in Karachi that we are working with the National Center of Big Data. And uh, Alhamdulillah, we have a lot of uh, researchers here and this working there. The overall objective and a mission at that time was a, to actually get the people introduced with the term Big Data. The things that okay now it's a time that we have to think out of the box. Now the personal computers, laptops, uh, and other things, it's fine. It's just for the surfing and for other the social media websites. But if you really want to uh, execute some technical uh, problems that you actually require uh, the things that can be done with these big data infrastructures, and. Uh, Big data is not just a thing that you can go if you have a huge data with you that uh, it's enough that you are processing, but actually it's a complete ecosystem. Means the people and the sources are continuously executing the data, emerging the data, creating the data. Uh, like uh, we have a lot of IoT devices here that, and IoT devices are always in hundreds and thousands, even in the millions. People are starting about the smart cars, smart cities, that we are talking about the gadgets, smart gadgets, people, I, myself, you and Mohammed was maybe the wearing at least three to four smart uh, watches and smart devices with you associated with. And obviously the Facebook, the people are just communicating with the things and they're just are sharing their uh, ideas. So that actually the data volume that are being generated. But the thing is that, okay, if we have a data is here, but as in the ecosystem, we have to save it, we have to evaluate it, we have to execute it, and we have to analyze it as well. So actually, complete infrastructure change is required. It is not about the second step. If I'm having a data, the first thing comes is how to save it, where to save it. Then the idea of the cloud computing approaches. And sometime and every time you will go with the big data term, you will always be associated with the cloud computer. Or the people think that, okay, the data is emerging so fast and I'm not much in that way. Okay, how can I save it into my local computers? Not possible. So how actually I cope up with that? Then the cloud computing, you can see in the last five to six years, the use of the cloud com computing emerges so rapidly. Means Every each and every IoT devices are now we get connected to the cloud and the data is just pushing to the cloud. And then at least we have a saved data. After saving the data, the things comes in here, how to analyze it. If I'm saving the data, so wow, it is because now data is becoming a goal. Now it's just sometimes you have much heard about it. Okay, now the gold data is something is gold. Uh, similarly, you have we have heard the term the gold mine. Now, the, from this associated, the term is data mining. The maximum data you have, you can analyze it, you can expect the features, you can expect the trends, you can visualize, you can forecast, you can predict. Those all the things you can do. So people started that. There's analyze. And obviously for this analytics, again, this requires a huge software change. Existing software techniques, existing programming languages, existing databases, existing computing infrastructures, all are incapable with that one to cope up with this big data. So people started to think about it, and then it's one of the emerging area that people realize it. Then you come up with the term Hadoop, Spark, that the people are started with this cloud computing data and they started to analyze it. And finally, that comes in the actually the result, the analyze the value of the data you are getting. Uh, just last thing that you can observe that 
in the some days before the Twitter was uh, again uh, the Google Twitter was sale out, and again by how much in a billions of dollars. Reason actually it contains each and every information, the thought process, the trends of each and every nation and every. They are just an open now. They are just are all of the things are all of the posts and sharings, likes, dislikes, our comments are. All the sharings are document shared, are all are being analyzed to analyze my personality. Even I come to know that you didn't get the even uh, multiple national visas, including USA and others. Even after getting the uh, surety or after getting the clarification from the Google and other stuff like this. Because you think that what are my trends of searching? What is my trends of discussing things? It's all that comes in. The value of the data is. So this is the things that finally the people started to realize and then this was all about that we started with that one and obviously for the nation specific to the pakistan initially we started with the four domains in pakistan realizing that these are the things that we actually we need uh one is a, one was a traffic modeling again a huge amount of traffic was generated there and uh, the especially in karachi and that started that okay this is the area where big data is being generated and we can uh, use the data analytics, especially the big data analytics, to solve the real time problem. Another thing associated with the Karachi only is a tsunami. Uh, as we know that the Karachi uh, is always being danger, and Karachi in the last in the 1940s we have already a tsunami history, and uh, it has always been uh, uh, ideal predicted that any time in Karachi we may the tsunami may hit. So there is a tsunami modeling, and this uh, we have a huge sea shore with us. And this is the huge data that we can generate and we can do for the national security and for the national level problem channels. So these are again second domain that we started to work on. Third, the genomics, the genes. One thing people may say that okay, there are a lot of work is being done genomics so why in Pakistan. Very interesting thing that for in every country, in every nation, in every uh, we have a different genome patterns. As in Pakistani, we have a different genomic pattern. The study being developed in some other country cannot be actually directly replicated on us. Maybe one medicine generated for a particular gene cannot be done because we have a different patterns. So this was the idea that we can, should document, we should bookmark, we should come up with the things that what actually the things is going in, especially in Karachi and Pakistan. So with that started the genomics. And another very important this is the space is all about. Uh, and it, uh, it is very common that uh, who rules the world, actually who rules the universe, actually is a world power. That you started with the, uh, Russia and then USA and then now the China and the India and all of this, who are space uh, is building. So we have sort of had that in Pakistan, we are just lacking like behind it. So this is all the other area that we can come up with a lot of data, with the actual natural data. But I think I can say that is a tsunami modeling, traffic modeling, it's all are uh, hybrid and it's a constructed data. But astronomy is all about the astronomy is also real data. So just to one of the very uh, making the things in the area, we also selected this one of the area, and we started the work on the astrophysics, genomics, tsunami modeling, and traffic modeling. This all are the big sources of the big data. Very quickly, not going in much detail because of the time uh, constraints. Uh, in astrophysics, what we have done the classification of the classical object detections. This is a big data challenge. We take the images, dark images. And that contains millions of stars in it. And then in the millions of stars, is we have to count it. And then after counting it, after then analyze it. Which one is a star? Which one is the uh, universe? Which is the different type of these stars we have? What are the classical different objects? Is this a planet? Is this a different is a asteroid? And something like that. So they have this special object as well. And we have developed it along the data. Again, the time series image data analysis. We are analyzing the solar flares. We are analyzing the solar for the last three years. And we are just finding it's a sunspot predictions. The sun is spots all the thing. And it's again, it's a real time. Every time, every day, we get a gigabytes of data. We collect it and then we process it and then we execute it. And obviously, uh, we have one of the other project is under, under the astrophysics is a simulation of observable units. We are just simulating it. And again, this is image in the observable universe requires a billions of a billions of stars in it. And then it's a, again, it's an open challenge. And uh, I am very much hopeful. Uh, if you continue to work in this astrophysics, inshallah, next Nobel Prize will be in Pakistan. Very soon. The other is a tsunami modeling. 
again, it's all about the Karachi coastlines that we have from Gawadar. Karachi is a very Sin uh, is a very uh, big coastline, starting from the Gawadar to uh, the Karachi lands uh, to Sin. Uh, so uh, we have completed Alhamdulillah from the Gawadar side. We have completed the Sin complete side, and just we are taking the things skip out of there. And we are very much stakeholders here. We are in contact with the different agencies. We are coming to the uh, NDMA, PDMA, in Balochistan, obviously, Metrological Department. We are always engaging with that one in order to study. And uh, very much uh, data has been gathered, and we are very much uh, able to predict the things. At least uh, we have uh, the, the evocation plan. We have uh, created that one. If in case, what will be the uh, worst part to be edited, and what will be the best thing that we can do at that time? Uh, this is the thing that we have already done. And again, it's a national level uh, things that we have done. Genomics, uh, we are in partnership with the Dow University of Health Science, University of Karachi, genetic testing company that's in government, just to things that okay, but, uh, we have a lot of data we have collected. With that. And obviously, as I said, that this uh, for Pakistan, this can be done in only in Pakistan. You cannot incorporate or import other genomics or you know, gene related information from other countries and try to incorporate here because we have a different personality, we have a different, may have a different genetic structures. We have a different face. Obviously, in Pakistan, we have a different colors, we have a different heights, we have a different uh, eating patterns, we have a different unique patterns that actually going to direct impact on the genes. And again, uh, a lot of study has been done in the uh, outside the international level, but in the Pakistan, we are among those that. Are. And again, is the gene genomics data is one of the big data. That contains a huge amount of the information, the gigabytes of that. Quickly uh, wrapping up the traffic modeling. This is something that we are doing, especially in Karachi. Uh, we are in, in corporate with the NHA. Uh, we have a SIN master authority system. We have a uh, incorporated with the KMC and we have a developed uh, different uh, and uh, plans and the different and, uh, models. And we have already proposed it. And uh, in the last, you have come to know that. Uh, right, uh, the, the the last train, last and last year, when uh, the Karachi was overflowed. Then we at NED and we are center working on the Nalas to clean all the areas. It's continuously working now by taking the roads, uh, map, and creating the maps on that, and then just giving with a clear path of that one. Again, this is one of the contribution towards the national uh, Pakistan uh, being a public university. Some other ongoing project we are in the NIBD uh, in the last week that what we have done, uh, the NIBD, uh, now the, uh, that started with that COVID level, uh, then we started that, okay, how can we come up with that, uh, this one, uh, National uh, Institute of Blood Diseases. Again, it's a complete, we have a 100 GPs of our data with that one, uh, of our different samples and with the permission of NIBD, and uh, we are just working on that to get a trace of the things that how uh, we can uh, come out with the disease, specific blood diseases in that one. This is the uh, driving pattern analysis. Is that one of the important things that we have done is also as an essay predict model of PR text predictors. And it was very interesting. Uh, every time uh, we have a data uh, released by the LPR and then we just gather it with the commit and then find out that by the uh, men and women and the national levels and district levels and different patterns we have uh, tried to find out. That. And those are very interesting results that we get. Uh, inshallah, uh, some <coughs> other time I will be sharing it uh, in more detail. That we are. This is again very important data. We have just with the population projection, demographic analysis of validation of Pakistan at the district levels. Uh, what have been done, uh, but it's not been, uh, it is done just simply. Uh, we have our countings, we have uh, normal uh, people counting at the heads and they have estimates. It is not an automated, uh, but we have verified it with the GIS system, with the information system, with the maps that object that actually shows the population. So that is the thing that we can go and uh, at what level. You can see that in Pakistan, you can see that some blue flame and then uh, in a Pakistan is covered by the blue and then some spotted light. This is the uh, population uh, level graphs that we have the light on the dense areas. So for the light dense areas, we compare the actual demographic numbers that are given by the government and we verified it from that one. And again, somehow we have uh, find that, okay, there are some numbers are missing there. So this is a very interesting study that we have done with respect to the big data. And now we are extending it to the Pakistan level after doing it to the city. And other the Karachi in a traffic incident is all about the big data. Thing is that these are some other projects that we can do if they are going there. So due to short of time, I'm just uh, giving it myself limited. 
but in short, you can find that uh, what actually I want to present here is that uh, big data problem can be easily handled in every aspect. In a national problems, now the data is generated a lot. So is every national problem is a big data problem. Every national problem you can tell because as much data you have, you can come. You can come with you. as much data you have, you must have information, you will analyze it, you can get different patterns from there, you can get different results there, and then you can make the better prediction and better forecast, better uh, policies for that one. Okay, fine, this is going to be work in the future. Uh, and lastly, the last thing uh, one can say okay, if we are talking about the big data, how we are going to up with the things, we are not using Alhamdulillah any of the outsource cloud, we have our own cloud setup. And this is the your cloud setup that you can uh, access at your own desktop as well. This is the available. This is the Aurora cloud that we have named it. And this is the, we have a 50 teraflops with a system memory of five terabytes RAM. We have a GPU supports totally, and we have a hybrid storage of 100 terabytes. So we have our own infrastructure, Alhamdulillah. And again, thanks to uh, HEC for giving the, the grants and the planning and commission. And then again, Alhamdulillah, we have just come with, it, with the cloud solutions. We are own setups. We can gathering the data at our own locations. We are not depending on other the third party or other international sources. We can say, uh, saving here the function. We are providing our resources to other institutions or other national universities as well to get that in process here and then come up with the, to solve the problems and analyze it on this. Table. This is all about from my side. Uh, thank you. Because of the time limitations, I have to just uh, limit myself. Uh, but again, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity again. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Muhammad Ali Ismail Saab, for uh, giving us a very comprehensive presentation on potential uses of big data, specifically in Pakistan, and uh, how our centers and how our institutions are utilizing that data uh, for human security and for uh, human benefit. Uh, with this, ladies and gentlemen, we will now move to our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Uh, Hussain Nadeem. Uh, Dr. Hussain Nadeem is a specialist in national security, geopolitics, and the narrative science industry. He has over a decade of work experience in the policy community, academia, think tanks, and the media industry. Before joining IPRI, Dr. Hassan Nadeem was the CEO of uh, Nerve Center, a data analytics and digital media firm based uh, out of Lahore. He has previously worked at the United States Institute of Peace, uh, the Wilson Center, and recently the South Asian Study Group at the University of Sydney where he taught international security in the 21st century. He has been published widely in the foreign policy, the National Interest, Sydney Morning Herald, and the Express Tribune. Uh, now I invite Dr. Sen Nadeem to share his remarks on big data analytics and information warfare in Pakistan. So you have the floor now. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. And a big thank you to ISSI for inviting me for this very important session. And I would also like to personally uh, congratulate uh, Ambassador Reza Ahmed, uh, who's taken, I recently noticed that ISSI is arranging a lot of these uh, AI related technology and emerging technology related events, uh, which is very interesting and which is very good because the conversation needs to start from think tanks. I am um, also want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Ismail Saab uh, for an excellent presentation. Uh, I think the work that is being done specifically on the traffic, uh, astrophysics, which is personally my passion as well. Uh, I think the data can tell a lot. It can tell a great story uh, from where I see it. And it can also tell us about the behavior patterns, which I'll discuss shortly as well. Uh, but very interesting work being done uh, by NED. My work is, uh, my background is basically I deal in the, uh, I do data for national security, which basically means a lot. Uh, includes understanding the national security patterns, uh, the patterns of suicide bombings, uh, what makes a terrorist, can we develop an algorithm that can have an early detection of suicide bomber. Recently, we noticed in the case of Shari Baloch, uh, the BLA operator who conducted a suicide attack, the evidence was already there in social media uh, days before, months before. So through data, we could have easily been able to pinpoint and be able to predict uh, not just the terrorist attack, but also the people at risk of radicalization. I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail of that. But before I do that, since we're talking about data, I want to start off with some data on this uh, subject as well. I, I want to basically explain the data in practice because a lot of the work uh, that Ismail Saba is doing is, is related to governance, traffic modeling and all. My work is mostly in national security and I'll tell you exactly where the problem is. 
how we see it and how that means uh, what that means in the terms of information warfare where which has become a buzzword uh, as has become ai blockchain and big data analytics as well uh, one i would like to start off with a disclaimer uh, it's very fancy to talk about big data uh, artificial intelligence sometimes these are common sense issues these are not some outdated technologies beyond our human comprehension these are very much comprehensible these are very much usable very easily adaptable and i think we need to uh, look at these technologies from a perspective of uh, uh comfort friendliness instead of that far away thing the things of the geeks at computer science laboratories who are doing it so i think there there needs to be develop a comfort at the policy level with these new technologies and the new terminologies as well uh, but to to bring it to more nuance into this and make it a little bit more intelligible i'll give just give you example of what big data is back during the cold war throughout the period between soviet union and the united states across the berlin wall if you wanted to source a national security strategy document of soviet union it would take you months you would spend millions of dollars to source that one document which explains the program of the national security and all of that uh now it's all available online it's everything is available the national security strategy of the us the british security strategy uh the phone numbers of all the employers the military officials and all of that and i also remember back in the days the the list of the serving military officers of the pakistan army was very coveted and the indians would try to find out who's who and who's where and all of that now if you go on wikipedia you can just google it and you'll have the full list of military officials of pakistan army and where they are posted and where were they posted before so information has become very much democratized and become very much readily accessible uh what i'm basically seeing is that at the there was a time in the 20 30 years back when the availability of data was the biggest problem there was no data the collection of data and the availability of data uh for the purpose of the policy was basically the challenge fast forward 20 years you have the data the real problem is do you have the ability to process that data or not and that is the fundamental challenge in the policy that we have too much data we have too much information and we have too little time and the ability to walk through that entire data uh at any given point right now the prime minister office the prime minister is receiving tons and tons of research tons and tons of data the art in the modern policy world is to identify what data sources are relevant which are quality and sift through the noise of the big data and be able to go into very deep to identify and make sense of what the patterns are so making sense of the data has become more 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 important than the availability of data which was a question before second data set i want to talk about which is much more related to the information warfare and i want to bring that 1999 pakistan there was one state run broadcaster raat ko 9 baje ka khabar nama uske baad military ko bhi lag jata hai to aapko 12 ghante se pehle nahi pata lagega it would take that much long because there was one broadcaster 10 years later 2009 under general musharraf zaira liberalization of media we had 150 state uh, private run broadcasters ary geo and all of that so the the narrative became moved from one state actor to 150 private actors i remember in 2009 there was a whole frustration specifically with general musharraf starting 2007 as well on how to deal with this explosion of channels who are now saying everything under the sun run by god knows who so there was that problem now imagine a little 99 2000 fast forward 2019 over 40 million social media users just in pakistan and i'm going to use the word individual broadcasters everyone who is on twitter everyone who is on facebook is now a broadcaster he has as much of a voice in the national narrative and the national story as the state run tv channel as much as the policy maker what has happened in the 20 years is that we have we have shifted from one state run narrative machine to 150 private narrative building machines to millions and millions of users which we do not even understand because they're generation z and millennials but they're part of the narrative building cycle so our ability to even process that much data to even monitor all of them is impossible in 2009 um ispr and other organizations had seven eight different schemes they would monitor the content ke kisne kis time ke upar kya baat ki kisne kya ki 
And when the push came to shove, if there was something at the stadium, you would switch off the TV. How do you switch off at a time like now when you have 40 plus million users? And by the way, this is just tip of the iceberg. Pakistan is projected to have 80 million social media users in the next few years, which basically means one thing. The ability to govern in the modern age is almost becoming impossible for not just Pakistan, but globally as well, simply because we don't have the tools and the, the state that is there, the state is still a post-colonial British era state, which is run still through the bureaucratic machinery and the whole processes and all of that. So the state does not have the capability or the capacity to be in a fifth generation warfare and to be in a digitalized world because there is a discrepancy and I'm not talking about the entire state. There are islands of successes within the state which are doing some excellent work, but the largest state and the ethos is still very much not uh, prepared to uh, deal with the data challenge. So, so the, when you talk about the big data, as Ismail was talking about, just in the narrative industry, this is what has happened. The chaos that you see right now in Pakistan and the media and the politics and all of that, this is not an artificial creation. This is an organic creation because the technology has changed so much and it has not matched the pace of the reforms in the policy sector. So countries like Australia, they don't have the same problem because the reforms in the institutions are very fast paced and they're very much intertwined with, this, with, the, with the private sector as well. So the technologies are being introduced in Australia and places like UK a lot faster than they are being integrated in the Pakistani system. Hence, the net result is that, that the states, I mean, in the Westphalian state order, you have a couple of things that the state has, uh, monopoly on violence, uh, monopoly on resources. And the third important thing is monopoly on national narratives. The monopoly on national narrative is no more with the state. The narrative is being set by the non-state actors, which includes a 16-year-old kid sitting in the bed and telling the chief army staff how to run the army. Uh, a physics students probably talking, uh, tweeting to Dr. Who the boy on how to think about physics. The issue is whether the opinion is credible or quality or not, the opinion is still there. So these are certain problems that are associated with that. Moving on, now, this creates one big problem, which is two big problems, actually. The first one being from the policy side, it is the decision making. The decision making in the digitalized world with so much information has become really, really pro problematic because now we're dealing with within an, uh, within a dimension of uncertainty where there are too many data points. The data is so humongous that the ability to cipher that data, process the data and make the decision, there are, it, has, it is becoming more and more problematic. One, because you cannot process, but two, there is also cognitive bias. The confirmation bias, because when you do selective data analysis, you're developing an eco chamber, which has become more problematic because more and more our policy community is relying on social media, not the genuine research, by the way, not the surveys, not the quality years and years long of research. It is relying on social media, especially Twitter trends to develop policy. Now, social media is artificially induced as well. So if you start taking social media too seriously, what happens is that you are constantly being triggered and driven through trends into, into a reactive mode. And what I've noticed, witnessed in the last 10 or 12 years of working in Pakistan, that our strategic policy making is essentially dead. We are now running on the day-to-day -day basis, on the week-to-week -week basis, after crisis to crisis, one to trend can uproot all the plans that were there for a week. So these are some very problematic things when it comes to the policy community. Now I'm going to shift from this policy challenge that I've uh, put down, moving it into the information warfare domain. Now information warfare domain is even more complicated because the digital has no borders. So it's not now the 34 million Pakistani users. What about those 1 billion users in India that are now tweeting on Pakistan in Pakistan? What about those 2 billion users from the rest of the world that are talking about Pakistan and all. How do you sift through that data? How do you make sense of that data? What about, I'll give you one example. In uh, two years back, we were monitoring the data, uh, digital traffic uh, during Muharram, just before that, there were 30 accounts that were made from a country I will not name, uh, which were presenting themselves to be one sect and 30 or 40 accounts which were presenting themselves to be from the other sect. 
cursing and abusing each other doing the seed activity which we call which triggered an overall rights between the two sects now the thing was when we went into the deep root of it those accounts were artificial being operated outside of pakistan but the artificial accounts were able to lead to a particular chaos into a reality on ground now these are some really problematic things when it comes to information warfare and disinformation warfare now one thing i want to be uh, put down as a disclaimer that information warfare is nothing new it's been present since the trojan wars the trojan horse was itself an information and disinformation campaign that was run so what has really changed as ambassador azaz also mentioned is the speed the digitalization provides the speed with which those actors for instance the state the state cannot have that level of speed that the private and the young audience has and one of the problems that we're facing right now when we look at the digital trends against the uh, the pakistan army at the moment is that the institution is voiceless it cannot continue to tweet at the speed at the intensity that a particular uh, the crowd politically charged or an angry crowd is tweeting so what is left then is that this is a domain where it is impossible for the state actors to play on equals with the non state actors now this is such a radical shift from 20 to 30 years back where the person with the gun was the most powerful the gun is irrelevant now i think the bomb is irrelevant how do you control the narrative space the information warfare where you don't know who's behind the identity could be an indian could be an afghan could be anybody could be your own people how do you know who's behind the the curtain the anonymity of the social media now why is that happening because social media is going to continue to be more decentralized the more decentralization happens in the social media the state cannot operate in the same way i mean let it be the last government be it this government or any future government unless the critical reforms and how the state and the political machinery is run is not undertaken it is almost impossible for us to even come close to the semblance of governance in the digital age and i'm talking about just information warfare and i'll give you a few examples of this as well uh afghanistan war uh unbelievable level of disinformation happened during that time from the allegations of pakistan army tanks rolling into panjshir to the the fake videos of uh, of video game jets bombing areas showing that this is our pakistani jets that was happening at a speed where the state had to rely on on the people and the decentralized individuals in pakistan who would fight that combat so what i am essentially saying from this entire conversation is that the state cannot be divorced from the public when it comes to the information warfare and comes to data the the more integration the more closeness the state has the only that's the only way the state can actually function in the disinformation and the information warfare domain now the second part about the the data analytics when it comes to national security and the information warfare you know what exactly is one of the main concerns and i think rightly pointed out by smile sir is the fact that the data you use from twitter from facebook from instagram and all of that that is essentially your behavior what you like what you dislike what you watch and all of that that data is sacred it's sacred reason why i say is that because the leakage of data or somebody using that data can tell exactly what time you wake up what time you sleep what is your behavior pattern who do you talk more who do you talk less what is your relationship with your parents what is your relationship with your wife etc etc so it's essentially at an individual level it is behavior analytics of your entire being at the city level it is the behavior mapping of the entire city at the national level it is the behavior mapping of the national a country on how a country behaves what are the triggers of a country what are the weaknesses of the country what are the the critical issues of the country what are the 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 fault lines of the country when such a data exist in a server in silicon valley or somewhere else it takes minutes minutes to then put a little bit narrative information domain to trigger a sunishia riot in pakistan a uh, riot against this a riot against that all you have to do is to know what triggers the public if you want to trigger the tlp we all know what it takes if you want to trigger a political party like pti we know what it triggers 
if you want to trigger the pakistani security establishment we know what it triggers so this entire data has provided behavior analytics of individuals institutions leadership and all of that this data is so dangerous because it can then be used in a way where it can be pulled in and pulled off switch on and off to be then able to in terms of the information warfare and we have seen that happening because when it comes to the behavior analytics the second component is the social engineering part of it and the social engineering part is one of the very very important things where how do you shape the mentality of the society how do you get them to go for a war how do you stop them from going for a war how do you change their behavior in terms of consumption of sugar for instance all these things i'm talking mostly on the national security part but there are also very useful uh, case studies where uh, the uh, the behavior change the nudge units which we are called uh, nudge units can shape the the patterns of consumption in a society if we think pakistan has the highest south asia by the way has the highest rate of uh, strokes and heart attacks how do you manage that because we realize that the consumption of sugar and wheat converted into sugar is the highest in this region which is why we have the highest level of cardiac arrest if the government wants to change that or to reduce diabetes the simple way is to develop a nudge unit to look at the patterns of consumption of sugar based on the different areas of pakistan district city wise and then you can start developing a targeted campaigns focusing on those regions so a lot of these things can be done in data but when it comes to this weaponization of data which is my main area the national security side the weaponization the human behavior the national behavior the local behavior the religious behavior all these behaviors are easily accessible a basic simple kid who can run r programming or python programming can scrape through the data from twitter which is now openly available as well and you can easily understand the patterns of an individual and then when you know the patterns you can essentially that's the raw intelligence that is there on what triggers and how does that happen so the information warfare routing it back uh, is essentially led by the speed essentially led by the anonymity and the decentralization of social media and also because the institutions that are there that provide information are not up to date with the modern technology in the fifth generation warfare so what they're doing is that they're trying to fight a fifth generation warfare with the third generation tactics with with the third generation mindset and with the first generation tactics the the state cannot function in the same way and hence the, the more and more there is need for the state to invest embed and also internalize and not be first of all afraid of what the big data can do it is the technology behind it is maybe or maybe not complicated now it's become even more easier but the use case of how it can actually work for the uh, for the betterment of pakistan's governance for the betterment of pakistan's national security policy and also for the betterment and protection of pakistan's national ideology on the ideological fronts that is most important because we're living in a world of digital which has no frontiers or borders hence we are playing at a level where chaos will follow unless we don't go completely data and digitalized thank you all stop there uh thank you very much uh, dr sir nadeem it was really very interesting i mean uh how you explain big data and how there are challenges ahead in terms of uh, utilizing its true potential even for a state even for an individual person i mean uh, it seems very difficult on one side that there is too much information and uh, we are unable to process that information for our day to day living but on the other side there are benefits of that information uh, by utilizing it we can identify many threats and many challenges which are being faced in our society and which are faced globally uh, so with this uh, we'll now move to our next speaker uh, fortunately we have um, one emerging expert in our center uh, and she is dealing with this emerging technologies and all these areas and uh, her name is ms amna rafi and uh, she is a research associate at the arms control and disarmament center previously she has worked with the act as pd and pakistan institute for parliamentary services pips islamabad and as a young parliamentarian subject as expert she assisted the senate standing committee on defense production at the parliament of pakistan ms rafi holds an mphil degree in international relations from qaid e azam university and her area of specialization is on cyberspace emerging technologies and arms control uh do i invite ms amna rafiq to share her remarks on building national framework for big data the way forward for pakistan you have the floor now 
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Sir Qasim, for your kind uh, introduction. And I'm also grateful uh, to the Ambassador Rezaz Ahmed Chaudhry for this opportunity. And I also want to thank uh, the two speakers uh, for their excellent uh, views. Dr. Ismail talked about the origin of the big data in its real time uh, uses in the fields of astrophysics, tsunami predictions, genomics, and traffic modeling. And uh, Dr. Nadeem uh, uh, brilliantly uh, uh, talked about the democratization of the big data processing and the governance challenges, information and disinformation warfare. So now as a last speaker, I will take this entire debate uh, to the next and the much needed uh, uh, discussion, uh, which is a way forward for Pakistan. Now from, uh, from all these uh, uh, positive and uh, the negative uh, implications of the big data, how we can develop uh, a national big data governance framework for Pakistan. So uh, this is the sequence of my presentation. Um, first of all, um, I will briefly uh, give an overview of the big data and the already discussed six Bs. Um, uh, after that, uh, uh, in the second section, I will talk about uh, the data governance framework especially uh, uh, the uh, UN uh, model framework, its uh, foundation, four pillars, and the basic elements. In the third section, I will discuss the data governance framework in Pakistan, what are the major challenges, and uh, what uh, legislative and uh, the policy initiatives were taken by uh, the governments in Pakistan in the last few years. And uh, in the at the end, I will uh, propose a few uh, recommendations based on uh, the emerging uh, trends uh, in the field of the uh, big data. So moving forward uh, to the brief introduction, as the uh, two speakers earlier uh, talked about uh, the uh, big data in uh, great detail. So now just, I want to just uh, mention few uh, uh, statistics like the data volume in uh, the 2020 were about the 50 zettabyte and compared to the 2010 when uh, there was just about the 1.2 zettabytes of the data worldwide. And now, um, as uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Nadim also talked about the speed and, and the speed with which the data is uh, being produced, uh, the expected volume of the data uh, um, uh, in uh, 2025 will be 175 zettabytes and it's doubling every 12 to 18 months. And uh, just like uh, the Dr. Ismail pointed out, uh, the main technologies uh, which are driving uh, this change are the big data analytics, cloud computing, social networking, and then we have the small sensors. Then uh, as uh, discussed uh, um, earlier that there are basically three uh, um, Vs of uh, the big data. And um, now we have added a lot of other data, uh, uh, Vs, volume, variety, velocity, and uh, veracity, value, variability. And uh, uh, the element about which Dr. Sand talked about is uh, the veracity. Uh, to what extent this big data can be trusted? Um, to what extent this data is uh, original? And uh, uh, to what extent it's is the fake or the deep fakes? Um, Next uh, section is about the data governance framework. So uh, this is the model proposed uh, by the uh, United Nations um, uh, and specifically the United Nations Department of Economics and the Social um, Affairs. So uh, the basic uh, the basic goal of uh, this uh, uh, governance model is to enable an environment for the data sharing, data linking, data interoperability, and the data exchanges. So uh, talking about this model, uh, obviously the basic foundation is the uh, data governance, and then um, this uh, data uh, big data governance model is integrated with uh, the uh, SDG Sustainable Development Goals, and uh, here the three uh, three values are really important accountability effectiveness and inclusiveness so uh, next there are the th four pillars of this uh, um, data governance model we we have the policies and the regulations then national data strategy and the leadership data ecosystem and the uh, uh, re relevant data technologies so it's all about the evidence based policy making data protection privacy and ethics uh, classification and standardization of uh, uh, the data is really important. Then uh, 
data sharing, linked data, and the interoperability of the data. Uh, uh, we uh, this also includes the open government uh, data and uh, the the basic uh, element uh, which is really important especially when it comes to the uh, war of narratives is the national digital identity uh, states have to identify or define uh, the their national digital identity uh, so that uh, uh, just like the doctor Hussein talked about the triggers. So once you have defined or ident identified what is your basic uh, national digital identity, uh, you can easily control those uh, triggers or you can modify your national digital identity accordingly. And then uh, we have the data roles and in the institutions. Um, uh, data ecosystem is also about the data literacy, creating awareness, especially when every individual is a broad broadcaster, then we have to work on the national level, each state, including Pakistan, on data literacy and the capacity development, people engagement, partnerships, and uh, then obviously uh, the data technologies, which include AI, machine learning, and the blockchains. So how this uh, model could be applicable in Pakistan and what are the current challenges we are facing uh, in this uh, field? So uh, the first and uh, the most important and the most typical uh, challenge in Pakistan is the insufficient and the fragment, uh, fragmented legislative policy and the technical framework. So here I want to give uh, this uh, overview of uh, the legislative and the policy framework, which, uh, which is currently uh, available in Pakistan. So uh, the normal pattern of developing uh, uh, governance or the regulatory framework for any field, uh, in any field is uh, the first you make a policy, then you devise a national strategy, then comes the legislation or the regulatory uh, or uh, the sanction regime. But in Pakistan, uh, we can clearly see that uh, there is a chaos regarding uh, the policy making, especially when it comes to the uh, big data. Like in 2016, instead of having a big data policy first, uh, we partially addressed this uh, issue in the PICA, uh, which is uh, popularly known as the Prevention of the Electronic Crimes Act. It, um, it, it This act, in my opinion, is like uh, government tried to introduce a one size fit all uh, kind of uh, solution to the entire problem because this act deals with uh, the data protection, uh, privacy, and then again, the cyber stalking, cyber bullying, um, and the hate speech and defamation all in one. So uh, there are approximately seven to eight articles uh, related to the unauthorized access and the transmission of the data in this act uh, are from article two to article eight. And then 2000, in 2018, we got the digital Pakistan policy. This is basically um, falls in the category of developing digital technologies for uh, the big data. And uh, this uh, digital policy talked about uh, the indigenization and the development of uh, the blockchain, AI, machine learning, and then uh, creating uh, or creating digital uh, literacy in Pakistan. And the best aspect of this policy was that every every element of this policy was linked with uh, the sustainable development goals. Um, then in 2020, we, we had the personal data protection bill, which is still in the pipeline. Then uh, things got much better and the clear uh, in 2021 when uh, we got the national, um, national security policy and then the national uh, cybersecurity policy, which are not directly related to the big data, but indirectly um, uh, it is uh, these documents are the part of the bigger ecosystem in Pakistan. And the first and the most relevant policy uh, which we got uh, is uh, the Pakistan cloud first policy back uh, like few months back. So uh, this is uh, this is uh, the overview of uh, the policy or uh, policy of the legislative uh, framework, uh, which is uh, currently um, operational in Pakistan, which is not uh, uh, excellent uh, but it's not uh, you can say that in a very uh, bad situation like we are there is a lot of room uh, for the improvement in this uh, structure so the second um, uh, important uh, second challenge is the absence of the institutional and the technical coordination on data partnership and between government and the other relevant stakeholders then uh, the data uh, lack of the data ecosystem uh, there is a lot of data fragmentation and and the a lot of data is in silos 
So uh, 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 then uh, we have the insufficient ICT infrastructure and the indigenization problem. Uh, also, um, all this framework comes with the huge uh, financial and the human resource uh, uh, cost. So Pakistan is still facing a lot of challenges in, in these areas as well. So uh, what is the way forward from here? So on the basis of the few emerging um, trends in the field of uh, big data, uh, I will recommend what we could do forward. So let's uh, look at some predictions. The first prediction is that big data will be fast replaced by the fast data. As uh, both uh, speakers earlier talked about uh, the velocity and the speed of the data. So now the big data, even the term of the big data is being replaced by the fast data. Now, what is fast data? Um, fast data is basically in, in, in very simple words, fast data is the data in motion. So uh, a very practical and the real time example of the fast data is this webinar. This, uh, this event is a data in motion. Uh, we are talking about the live streaming. So more data will be streaming in real time. And according to some experts, all companies are becoming uh, like uh, are investing in the streaming business and uh, um, in trust in acquiring external data will increase. The second uh, uh, trend is the more data types and the higher abstractions of the data will emerge. Um, an increase in the data volume comes with an increase in the variety in the types of the data. So common data sources will include the internet of things. Then uh, a lot of autonomous vehicles are generating different categories of uh, data. And then we have imaging devices. We have, we got drones, we got smart um, advisors, and then virtual personal assistants like Siri in our uh, cell phones and uh, small sensors, wearable sensors and devices. So to handle this huge amount of the data, new data formats and the storage scheme will be introduced uh, in the market and data will be categorized by the cognitive value. Uh, uh, this uh, aspect is really important that it will be categorized by the cognitive value it will provide, not by the source that created it. So uh, earlier, Dr. Hussain also talked about uh, the uh, noise in the data. So uh, this this uh, this element is really important. And like now, it's a time to reduce that noise and um, extract the data which is actually valuable and it's actually contributing. So now, Pakistan, uh, whenever we are, uh, whenever we decide to go forward with uh, the proper uh, regulatory framework in Pakistan, we have to take into uh, um, keep uh, the fast data and the new methods of the data analytics in mind. The, the next big trend will be the new analytics method will, uh, uh, that will revolutionize the uh, data science. New techniques, new tools, and new algorithms will, develop, uh, will deliver incredible insights, AI. We have machine learning-based solutions. And uh, it will also cause a shift in the global job market. Uh, there will be a lot of new opportunities for the data experts. So Pakistan have to invest a lot in developing uh, a human resource. Uh, its own national human resource, uh, not only to um, fulfill its uh, national needs, but also use these experts as a diaspora, like uh, uh, like in the international companies and in, uh, in other countries. Um, uh, another uh, big uh, issue that will emerge and uh, where Pakistan must work uh, is the big data, uh, uh, the privacy issue around the big data. So new privacy regulations will become more specific and personalized, like Dr. Uh, uh, Nadeem uh, also talked about the individual broadcasters. So now the privacy will uh, privacy regulations will also move towards the individual users. Now we are talking about the personalized control of the data privacy. And now uh, this um, personalized control of the data privacy will force companies to accommodate personalized security. We will have our own custom privacy settings and the privacy procedures. So uh, at the national level, there is a need to develop uh, public awareness about uh, these privacy issues. Then uh, uh, the, another big change will be a data uh, and the analytics will emerge as a service business model. Now, uh, uh, we all, previously we talked about 
uh, or heard about the malicious use of these data companies uh, and their interference in the um, elections in the US. And uh, it is basically a, a technique called the micro-targeting. Uh, Dr. Sen also talked about this. So now it will become a more legitimate and illegal business where uh, cloud providers um, will expand their business model to include data as a service and uh, uh, data as a service and the analytics as a service. And there is a possibility that you may outsource your entire data services and data governance to a third party company. Um, uh, and in few years, it will become a reality. Uh, uh, however, it will come with a great uh, cost. And the recent examples of uh, this venture includes Microsoft's Cog Cognitive Services and the Amazon's uh, SageMaker. The next big trend uh, which uh, we should expect is the data partnership will drive uh, the business partnership and uh, defense partnerships and uh, the diplomacy. You, um, we have previously discussed in a lot of our events uh, about the US-India strategic partnership in the Indo-Pacific and the different agreements, Beka, Lima, Kamkasa, uh, the exchange of the data, real-time military information uh, or, uh, lies at the core of all those agreements. So uh, whether it's the business, defense, and, um, and there is a new emerging field of the data diplomacy where you you are uh, you have to use your diplomatic uh, community uh, to enhance your uh, national interest vis-a-vis -vis, uh, data so uh, this uh, this would be a new uh, trend so um, uh, that's all from uh, my side i look forward to uh, the question and answer session thank you so much uh, thank you very much amla for giving an excellent presentation uh, ladies and gentlemen, I believe uh, the topic was so interesting and especially the remarks by the speakers were so interesting that uh, we failed to take the uh, track of time. Uh, but still, uh, uh, with the permission of speakers, I would like to take two or three quick questions. Uh, and I believe that uh, this center is, uh, because as uh, this is the part of the series of emerging technology talks and a webinar, and we will continue this uh, program in uh, the coming months and we'll hold more and more uh, program on these issues, especially on emerging technologies in this area. Uh, so basically, uh, there are two or three questions, a quick question from the participants. Uh, one is uh, uh, that as the failure of big data and national security lies uh, in human ability to embrace the power and uh, mitigate the limits of algorithms, how can we policymakers, academicians, uh, develop this ability in the era of post-truth. And uh, second uh, uh, is about, uh, I'm not touched upon it, but can you further elaborate what normative and legal framework is available in Pakistan at the national level to regulate big data? So for the first question, I will invite Dr. Uh, Ali Ismail and then uh, Sen Nadeem, and then later I'll invite uh, Ms. Amna Rafiq to respond to this question. Thank you once again. Uh, actually, Algorithmic development is uh, all about uh, that what the vision you are having and what actually you want to execute in your mind. Uh, absolutely uh, agree with the other speakers that if we have a right policy speak and if we have very predefined uh, uh, objectives with us, so obviously that uh, development accordingly will lead towards our success always. And in the case when we have no direction and the people are working randomly and the things that, then the, this problems came in. Okay, the things is that if some of the uh, uh, application or the solution developed for a specific type, then a specific thought in mind, then obviously there's always a chance to uh, get misbehaved and get the, some malfunctioning on that. So that's an important thing that you have a clear objectives in your mind. Uh, we have a good, right policies that you can create with that one. Actually, we, algorithm designing and the failures is all about the thing that we are process. Is this is the idea? Being a uh, uh, diplomatic and being a, at this level, I would say that. But if you thought about as a, a programmers level, so that's a different things. That is a okay. That may be a potential of creating some. Uh, or unlawful things or the some corrupt data or some uh, misleading data 
uh, that may cause obviously if you don't have a real tech data with you and you are just started to work or build on some uh, uh, AI level systems on that. And obviously that will lead to some current results, some wrong results. So this is a thing that what level you have, uh, data verification that are important, is very important uh, whenever you use the data uh, is very important, make sure hundred times, I think, uh, think about that data before using that, that it is from the verified sources or not. That is, uh, this is a thing that we can do it. Uh, I hope uh, I have answered the answer, I have answered the question. If not, then. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, Dr. Hussain uh, sir, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, as I understand, the question is uh, really about how the entire changes um, should prepare the academics and the policy makers to uh, navigate and maneuver through this entire uh, data uh, intensive world where we're living. And I'll give, give some ex uh, example on that as well that I work both on the academic side and in the policy side and also on the, on the technology side. What has happened, like I've talked about the state already, that the state that we have right now is still the architecture of the British era. It's the remnant of the British Empire, uh, which has changed not significantly. I mean, I'll give you one small example of that is that anybody who's worked in the government over here would know that uh, but here is a beautiful part that 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 Dori Villa system is pre-partition 100 years back. But with that, we have updated that in the 1980s, 1990s, there were fax machines. So, in every government, you will get a fax machine. And when the email system came, then at this time, the emails are also in your government. But the most beautiful part about the Pakistani state, because I worked a lot on the institutional reforms, is our unwillingness to move entirely from the previous technology. So now in Pakistan, you have a file on the DORI, you have a fax on the DORI, and you have an email on it, and you have a new one on which you have a WhatsApp on the DORI. So we've, we, in, in any state institution that you go, there is a 100, 120 years of practice that is still intact. No change in your life. Reason why I'm mentioning this thing is because it answers the question that is being asked. The academia in Pakistan is also not, has not changed entirely. And I'm talking mostly about the social science academia, which is prevalent. The technical side changes much quickly. Uh, social science academia and research in Pakistan is still using very, very base level qualitative work. And I'm not, this is nothing against the qualitative work. I think qualitative work presents an excellent insight, a deeper insight. But what I'm basically saying is that, that we live in a world with mixed method approach is perhaps the most important approach. Reason why I'm saying is that because the, the, the quant data, which we call the quant, has become so robust, as I've mentioned how the data has changed, that it provides a, an elevation and it provides much better, uh, if you're able to use it, it provides an excellent level of qualitative analysis. If you're able to fetch out the patterns and the analysis, so, Instead of treating quant and qualitative separate, I do think that they talk to each other and they're two sides of the same coin. And one helps the other develop a nuance, the other helps uh, the, the previous one to see the bigger picture, which I think is very, very important over here. Unfortunately, what has happened is that in Pakistan, uh, for instance, when I was in college 12 to 13 years back, they were teaching R back then. Uh, by the time I was graduating and then the Python language came in. In Pakistan, when the whole quant thing started recently, they're teaching languages that are probably outdated by now in universities. Uh, the, 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 in, the, the focus on Python isn't there, the focus is still on R. To conclude, the academia in Pakistan and the state both have to be innovative. There is no second opinion on it. If you want to fight the fifth generation warfare, if you want to have the new governance models, you need to be innovative enough, which basically means what? Innovative is not a rocket science. Innovation means that well, doing, adopting technology into your daily practices. How do you integrate those technologies in a way that takes a lot of your life and your work easier? That's basically what needs to be done, both at academia and at the state level. 
Uh, thank you, Dr. Sanadeep. Uh, Ms. Okay. Amnar, take okay. care. Regarding the uh, question about the normative and the legal framework in Pakistan, so whenever we talk about the norm, uh, norms in, in uh, any particular field or the area, it is uh, uh, it is already like they exist in our uh, uh, debate and the circles. Like when we talk about the SDGs, they talk about the effectiveness, accountability, transparency, in inclusiveness. The, these all norms ex already exist. But at national level, when we talk about the norm, Normative framework. Normative framework is basically provided within the policy uh, on that particular uh, uh, issue area. So, if you pick any policy ko, uh, pick kar le and you read that document, the background or introductory part is the first scope defined or the uh, policy deliverables are defined. So, in uh, one or two lines, they define the ethical and the normative uh, foundation of that policy. So, uh, as we don't have the big data policy right now, so uh, we can't say that what exactly normative uh, norms uh, the government of the Pakistan is trying to achieve in this area. But uh, um, uh, overall, uh, transparency, accountability, and uh, inclusiveness, these all, uh, these all, the all uh, values exist in Pakistan. Regarding, regarding the uh, legal framework, I already talked about this in my presentation that right now, we don't have any specific uh, uh, um, legal document or the act that deals with the big data issue, the data protection and the privacy. The, uh, the only, uh, uh, the, the one uh, proposal or the bill which is in, uh, currently in the pipeline or, or is, uh, uh, is quite controversial and uh, various drafts are being discussed is the personal data protection bill. So, um, cabinet se ya parliament se pass through nahi ho jata, we don't have any uh, uh, specific in, uh, bill on the data protection. Sir, partially, this issue area dis, uh, address ho raha hai PICA mein, jo maine already uh, discussed kiya tha ki when uh, you read the, uh, um, this act and from Article 2 to Article 8, this act uh, talk about the unauthorized access transmission of uh, transmission and the copying of uh, the uh, critical uh, uh, critical infrastructure uh, data so uh, uh, there are sanctions bhi hai, there are penalties and uh, all that uh, stuff uh, right now these are the two three documents uh, pakistan ki cloud first policy a certain aspect ko deal karti hai but entirely uh, does not provide the legal or the normative framework for the big data because uh, as uh, I talked about in the, uh, the, the governance model uh, uh, slide because there are various pillars. We, we got the policy, we got uh, legislation, then we have the national data strategy, data ecosystem, and then data technology. So in every area, even we have to develop different normative and the legal framework, not just in the policy and the regulation section, but also about uh, the data technologies, and then also about uh, the people and engagements. And we also have to develop the legal and the normative framework about uh, the nature of the partnerships we want in the field of the big data. So that falls in the the pillar of the data ecosystem. So this entire legal and the normative uh, game within uh, the big data governance structure is really complex. So uh, um, uh, every act and the policy will act as a building block and ultimately we will get uh, an effective and uh, 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 like uh, effective and comprehensive uh, data governance structure. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Amna. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, with this, we come to the end of, of this uh, question answer session. I believe that due to shortage of time, we can't continue it further. Uh, but we'll hold another event on these uh, issues and these topics. And uh, once again, I thank you, uh, all the speakers, uh, for their excellent remarks and presentation. And now we'll move towards our last segment, that is a uh, vote of thanks uh, from Mr. Uh, Mr. Khalid Mahmood, Chairman Board of Governors of Institute of Strategic Studies, Islamabad. Uh, Ambassador Khalid Mahmood uh, is a former ambassador of Pakistan to Iran, Iraq, China, Saudi Arabia, and Mongolia. He has served as first secretary and later as deputy permanent representative of Pakistan to United Nations New York. He has worked as the work as director UN, and director general UN, additional secretary United Nations Asia Pacific and Africa, and former permanent representative of Pakistan to the Organization of Islamic Conference and the Economic Cooperation Organization. Sir, you have the floor now. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. 
Uh, first, of course, uh, words of great uh, appreciation to the Arms Control and Disarmament Center of the Institute of Strategic Studies, Islamabad, on organizing uh, a seminar on yet another uh, topic, which is a bit arcane, uh, but very important, you know. Uh, so the world has been uh, witnessing uh, or experiencing a relentless march of uh, technology from electric to electronic to computer to new emerging technologies, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, and so on, you know. And big data is uh, another all pervasive uh, feature of uh, uh, all these uh, technologies. Uh, but what is the uh, you know, significant thing is the astonishing speed with which all these technologies are developing. Uh, as I understand, you know, that every action creates uh, a data. So far, the data has been kept in physical form as it was being pointed in files or books or, you know, reports. Now it is being kept uh, in virtually, you know, as they say, in clouds. Uh, big, and it's called big data. It is stored there, it is managed there, analyzed there, and from then transmitted onward uh, uh, from there. Uh, and there is a, a big surge of the volume, velocity, and variety of uh, data. Now this data is proving to be uh, of great help uh, in tackling challenges in the field of education, health, communication, transport, disaster management, as well as in national security. But of course there are lots of advantages uh, that which one can drive from these technologies or big data, uh, but then there is a downside also, like any, any other technology, as we have the examples of, you know, uh, uh, risks uh, which were evident during uh, uh, Stuxnet uh, malware attack on Iranian nuclear facilities, and Pegasus spyware, um, uh, spyware, etc. you know. And then there's the first, uh, the risk of uh, abuse of personal data, not only by state, but even by non-state actors. So we have to find solutions to mitigate, contain, and eliminate these risks, uh, which cause, uh, which can cause uh, great uh, uh, damage. Of course, efforts are afoot at national, regional, and international level, uh, but still, I think much more needs to be done. As has been pointed out, Pakistan uh, is becoming gradually uh, uh, tech savvy and uh, uh, in the internet field, in the communication technology, uh, Nadra is uh, using this you know, big data, banking, PIA, uh, then service delivery, health sector, uh, FPR is using it in the, the you know, online tax return systems uh, and so on. Uh, in fact, Pakistan is the first country which, uh, in the SARC region, uh, which uh, adopted this uh, e-government policy in 2002. And then we are also trying to make use of this under the rubric of uh, CPAC as the uh, digital corridor through by utilizing optical fiber. Uh, but we are not immune to attacks. Like I was read, surprised to read somewhere that 1 million cyber attacks in Pakistan have taken place since January 2001. Uh, of course, many have been foiled, but the enormity of the problem is there because even such big, uh, important institutions like National Bank of Pakistan, FPR, you know, they have been the target of these uh, uh, cyber attacks. 
but happily we are on the right track uh, and uh, uh, in this seminar has helped us in uh, raising the awareness of the issue uh, or the diverse uses to which uh, big data can be put through of our good or bad, you know, the challenges, uh, the risks, uh, and also the way forward. Uh, so many suggestions have been made in this regard, and uh, we need to focus on our capacity building, both in the hard and uh, soft uh, uh, arenas, and regulatory mechanisms have to be finalized as soon as possible. As I, I if my understanding is right, that only there is one ordinance, you know, the Speaker uh, right. Act, you know, PICA. Uh, apart from that, the, all other things are still in the air, you know. And the earlier we uh, address these uh, very vital issues, the uh, better. Uh, and, uh, but of course, uh, there is always the need for a greater public private partnership uh, in developing our capacity and these regulatory. Uh, mechanisms. So I thank uh, all the participants uh, really who have enriched uh, us and all those who have been following this seminar uh, with the intricacies uh, of uh, uh, this very important uh, issue. And uh, uh, hopefully in, in the next uh, 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 webinar, which uh, the center will organize, uh, we will uh, be more uh, informed about uh, uh, the potential uh, and the risk of uh, inherent in these technologies. Thank you again. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Khalid Mamusab. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, with this, we come to the end of this event. Uh, I thank you, uh, Dr. Muhammad Ali Ismail, uh, Dr. Hussain Nadeem, and Ms. Amna Rafiq for their excellent presentations. And uh, I would encourage all the participants uh, to kindly visit our website that is www.issi.org.pk for the report and post-event activities of this web. So with this, I once again thank you all.